Lydia Rita Ferguson was born September 14, 1881 in the thriving seaport town of Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, Canada. Both Rita's parents were known for their hardworking and adventuresome spirits. Her father, Captain Richard Morton Ferguson, built his fortune sailing the high seas as a merchant mariner. During their travels, the Fergusons sometimes brought along the children, believe it or not, <laughs> giving them an experiential education of the ways of the world. Young Rita was known to tend to the ailments of her father's crew, such as the time she managed frostbitten limbs encountered in the treacherous waters off South America. At home, Rita's and her siblings were exposed to a broad range of ideas. The extended family attended the Congregationalist Church and some were heavily involved in municipal politics. Although Rita was raised in an atmosphere of privilege and means, at a very young age, the family observed her special inclination towards nursing and helping others. Her manner was consistently described as compassionate, a kind, nice person who was never argumentative. So Rita graduated from Worcester City Hospital Training School for Nurses near Boston, Massachusetts at the turn of the 20th century and worked nearby for nearly two decades. In late 1911, she became the, a register, registered which the American Red Cross Nursing Service. Under the chairmanship of one of the famous nurses, Jane Delano, a national committee of American Red Cross had formed a few years before to recruit and credential professional nurses. So nearing midlife, Rita seized the opportunity to combine her professional experience with international travel and ride the perils and potential inherent in wartime nursing service. Beginning in 1915, Harvard University provided exclusive nursing services with a specialized team of health professionals to General Hospital Number 22 at Camers, Danes Camers, France. Well, there she is. So the president of Harvard University, A.W. Lawrence, authorized Rita to serve on the Harvard Surgical Unit with the British Expeditionary Force. So led by Colonel Hubert, sorry, Hugh Cabot, a surgeon, academic, educator, and medical reformer, the healthcare entourage sailed from England aboard the Canard RMS Andonia. During the crossing, shipmates entertained themselves while raising funds for a Liverpool orphanage. So as Rita reached France, yeah, you have to go ahead, Belle, sorry, there. As Rita reached France, she must have stared in amazement so I just want to show you the picture of France that you see in front of you, and you'll recognize some of that. And all of those dots that you see are places where the Red Cross Society was, the American Red Cross Society was active. And if you see at the top of it on the coast, there's a little X. And that's where uh, General Hospital number 22 was, um, was located. So that gives you an idea about where she was located. So she must have stared in amazement. A tent city of hospitals, numbers 5, 11, and 22, was built in a shallow valley between two chalk hills within the site of the English Channel at Demir's Khmer. A few roads of sheds lay atop a muddy ground, and a railway line ran between them. Wooden walk bridges of mud from one shed to another they would go. Nurses who served with Rita set the scene for what she must have faced. And I quote, 10 kilometers from here, 
Men are wounded. Men come back to us in ambulances, lying in stretchers, pulled out as loaves out of an oven. They are carried into the sheds, unclean bundles, very heavy, covered with brown blankets. We observe whining sounds, smells. We lift him, peel off his clothes, stiff with blood, cut off his shirt, stare at the obscene sight of his innocent wounds. He allows us helpless to stop. We confer together and he hears, makes calculation with his heartbeat and the pumping of his lungs. We conspire against his right to die. He finds himself in the operating room, bears himself to our knives, mind annihilated, red blood spilled onto the floor while he sleeps. We carry him into another place and put him to bed. He awakes bewildered, moans a little, lies still again. He is obedient. We feed him, watch him all day and all night. Every day his wounds are uncovered and cleaned and scraped and washed and bound again. We tend it so carefully. Along with the dedicated nurses at hospital number 22, the healthcare team was also included specialized doctors and technicians who, together with the nurses, conspired to cheat the enemy of death. A woman from Australia who studied radiography at Stanford University joined the Harvard Surgical Unit and ran the x-ray services. All the while the staff made do with rudimentary equipment and stark li living conditions. Throughout the war, the ARC provided a variety of institutional and auxiliary health services. Wounded stone soldiers were treated in the series of settings from rescue to convalescence. For example, during a short respite in her work in France, Rita accompanied blind soldiers from the British convalescent home to a river outing. So these blind soldiers would have been blinded by the, um, the gas in the trenches from, um, yeah, what, what was that chemical? Yeah, anyway, I forget. <laughs> Sometimes fraught with periods of fear when fun and fortitude. So on uh, September 4th, 1917, hospital number five, which was adjacent to hospital number 22, was bombed, resulting in several fatalities and casualties. So to protect themselves, nurses dug below the level of ground to form shallow graves two by six by 18 inches. And when the shells were falling, we partly closed over the floor with a piece of sheet iron. And there she is. <laughs> Amidst Rita's work, she also had times of celebration and sightseeing in the French countryside. Okay, so war ended in November 1918. The nursing service epitomized the collective accomplishment of the Red Cross services, uh, services overseas. The hospital administered by the Red Cross served over uh, 91,000 patients. Incredibly, over 10,000 operations were performed and less than, less than, 1,500 patients died. It's an amazing accomplishment. In a letter to the President of the United States, the British Foreign Secretary, A. James Belfour, singled out and extolled his appreciation for the, quote, skillful and untiring treatment of the wounded by the Harvard Surgical Medical Unit at General 22, the largest hospital serving the British Army. So with the war over, Rita found herself in France contemplating what she would do next. 
Shortly after the armistice, she was given leave to travel to Paris, where she helped with an RCA Thanksgiving dinner for hospitalized men. Okay. Okay, I think you need to advance, Bell. sorry. There she relaxed with her, keep going, there we are. There she relaxed with her brother-in-law and our grandfather, Lieutenant Samuel Clifford Hood. Yeah, so that's our grandfather and, uh, and Rita. So, she really, so at this time, she received a letter on behalf of Colonel Gibson, the commissioner for France, commending her for her loyalty and earnestness in the efficient service rendered to the American Red Cross. The final leg of Rita's work overseas began in Paris after the demonition of French program in the ARC nursing, nursing services. On another war front, the British had also been victorious over the Turks. This opened the way for relief efforts in Palestine and Syria. In December, 1918, Colonel John Finley, the commissioner for Palestine, traveled to France to recruit nurses. And if you see in the picture here, you will see a number of those nurses. They were actually 19, but Rita is the third from the right-hand side of the picture. She's the short one there. And, uh, and I think that's the, the two accompanied men are on the side. And I think there are nine in there. All of those are nursing sisters and they are in full dress uniform, just so that you know. <clears throat> but there, were, there, were, there was just a portion of them. I think there were 19 in total. Anyway, Finley later wrote to Rita's father and in a handwritten postscript described how he and the other officials had quote, unanimously accepted her at sight in Paris and knew with confidence that she will be most helpful and then some. <laughs> it was customary of the time, you know, um, you have to realize that women didn't have the vote at this time and that actually her father, Richard Morton Ferguson, he had to give permission for her to go. And so there was always correspondence between him and the officials. It's very interesting. Okay, so Rita and 19 other nurses left Paris in late January 1919. They traveled via railway ship through Rome, Toronto, Italy would be, and Egypt to Jerusalem. After a short stay, uh, okay, so I want to look at the map here and uh, just speak to the map for a moment that you see in front of you. So I don't know if you can understand that, but on the left-hand side, it's the Mediterranean Sea. And on the right hand, it's the coast of modern day Israel and Egypt below and um, Syria modern day and up into Turkey um, is what you see. And all of those dots are places where they established, which I'm gonna tell you about the American Red Cross nervous, uh, nursing services and um, were in all of those dots. And Rita was where the X is at the top. Um, and we and so just to give you an idea where that is. And by the way, when Rita was there, it was Syria. And not long after she left, which we'll tell you about, uh, they changed the borderline and it's actually now, um, I'll just tell you now, it's um, Gaziantep, Turkey is where we understand that she was. So that, um, that's there. So after a short visit in Egypt, the adventure continued to unfold in Rita's world. So these are her own words that are published. We changed at a place called Kantara and came up on a train with only seats to sleep on and no bedding. But our chief had provided us each with two blankets before leaving Cairo. And Belle, can you advance to, yeah, those, this is, okay, so there you go. So this is the picture that, uh, this is where she was in Egypt. And if you can see, you might recognize some things in the background. It's the Sphinx and Giza in front of the pyramids. 
And those are four nursing sisters in full nursing uniforms on camels in the front of the Sphinx and the, and the thing. And that is Rita right in the middle of the picture, the shorter one with the little, with the little hat. Pretty amazing. <laughs> so with two blankets before leaving Cairo, and I used my own steamer rug for a pillow. So it was very comfortable. We arrived at Tud and had breakfast in a desert tent. It was great. I'll never forget it. All the country along the way, so green and beautiful, the orange trees all about. Oranges sell for six for five cents. Almond trees, olive trees, and the wild flowers were beautiful to behold. Arrived at Jerusalem on the 11.30 a.m. and such a welcome. So there she is in the front of the uh, American Red Cross headquarters in Jerusalem. Rita went on to describe her impressions of visiting numerous sites of biblical significance. A few days later, she wrote of the impact that sightseeing travels near Jerusalem um, were having on her. So she writes, yesterday, we started for Jericho, River Jordan, and the Dead Sea at 8 a.m. in a cattle truck. It was certainly jolly, but I'm somewhat bruised from the jolting. Um, we went through Bethany, saw the tomb of Lazarus, Lazarus, and ruined tower that they say was the house of Simon. Then we called, came to Jericho, a village of only 300 in inhabitants. What we saw of it seemed poor, very poor. Here was a mountain where Jesus spent his 40 days of fasting. We then went to Jordan. Many natives were bathing, but it seemed altogether dirty to bathe in. We stopped and had lunch on the banks of the Jordan. Then we went eight miles to the Dead or Salt Sea. This was most beautiful. It seemed to me as though Jordan should have been the Dead Sea and vice versa. And can you believe it? I went for a swim. We saw the most beautiful sunset on our return and how, how I wish you could have been with me. It was marvelous. As thrilling as Rita's adventures may have appeared, by her correspondence, circumstances related to her work in Palestine must have been very unclear. For by the time Rita and her group of nurses from France arrived in Jerusalem, a nurse who was supposed to be in charge of the Palestine ARC nursing service had left. The physician in charge of health services said she left because of his suggestion due to the complexities that were, quote, organized on an entirely different plane than in France, there was no place for a director of nursing service. Despite the seeming disarray of nursing organizations, Colonel Ward planned to mix groups of nurses, social work, and, and secretaries, treating them all on par. And that's a quote. And send them to work in various hospitals and dispensaries throughout the region. General Allenby of the Egyptian Ex Expeditionary Force wrote Colonel Finley, Finley welcoming, and his, uh, welcoming him and his new recruits to Palestine. Allenby emphasized the need for relief work from the American Red Cross Commission as his troops established themselves in the district along and north of the Baghdad Highway, especially in Syria, where there was particular distress. Now, I don't know if you realize how quickly this happened in history, but Allenby literally, uh, you know, marched the forces right straight up the, the day. I mean, you know, they took, they took over control of the Turkish area very, very quickly and, and moved up. And so there was a tremendous amount of, um, of distress and so on. So I continue. 
Writing to friends and family in Yarmouth, Rita announced the news of her impending departure that ultimately would take her into Turkey to work with refugees from the Armenian deportation of 1915. I've just been told that we start north on the 24th at 5 a.m. Some going to Damascus, Aleppo, Beirut, and Tab, and I'm going to on top, 80 miles beyond Aleppo into Armenia, stopping at Damascus for one day. To glean some idea of what she must have faced, one must understand a bit of the geography and the social political history leading up to the armistice signed with Turkey. Aleppo is an historic crossroads in Middle Eastern area. Uh, it's a cultural melting pot in the north of Syria on a plateau halfway between the Mediterranean Sea and the Euphrates River. For the previous five few years, Armenian refugees had been deported from Turkey and herded all through Aleppo. Nearly 500,000 exiles congregated in and around the area, many of whom had only grass to eat and were starving to death. Under the supervision of Colonel St. John Ward, Rita embarked on five months of health and social services in the most remote Red Cross post of Antab, um, located on a barren plateau 80 miles north of Aleppo, within the reaches of Turkey. After a long siege, the French had captured it from the Muslim-dominated Turks. During Rita's tenure in Antab, the French stayed and continued to protect the mostly Christian Armenian community. However, the situation for American foreigners became increasingly dangerous as the locals continued to resist. Shortly before the French abandoned the area, two missionaries were ambushed and killed on the road between Antab and Aleppo. Although an armistice was in place and Rita was formally engaged in peacetime relief work, she must have been cognizant of the parallel she, uh, peril she faced where the dominant population was hostile to foreigners. In his letter of release from service dated June 30th, 1919, Major Ward referred how Rita honorably and credibly served the Palis Palestinian Commission of the American Red Cross. Upon her return to North America, she was personally congratulated by John Finley, who soon after honored her with the Foreign Service six, um, cert Certificate signed by the President of the United States, Woodrow Wilson, the Chairman of the War Council, H.P. Davidson, and the Deputy, Deputy Commissioner for France, Major Kenneth Mygat. So by 1920, Rita was nearing her 40th birthday. She returned to her home in Canada and married a widower, uh, William Kirk, if anybody remembers him. She married a widower. Although she never actively again nursed, she remained active in the Alumni Association of the Harvard British Expeditionary Force. And in 1938, Rita returned to Boston for a grand reunion at, at Harvard. In 